Hello, everyone. Welcome to this talk. Obviously, I'm Ryan. I've been at Notch for three years. First employee. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, uh, so, I guess interactions are introductions are done, so I'll get right onto it. You're probably wondering what this talk is, because the title was a bit vague. Well, for the next 30 to 40 minutes, I'm, or hopefully uh, sooner, I'm going to be talking you through how to take stuff in and out of Notch. Uh, I've split it up into three sections, uh, video, geometry and particles, and then we're going to go to a quick Q&A before we can go and get hammered. Before I start, uh, I'm expecting the answer to be everyone, but how many of you have actually used Notch before? That is absolutely everyone, aside from the one who's looking at his phone. <laughs> okay, uh, and how many of you would call yourselves advanced users? Nobody, aside from Will, hesitantly. <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, for the none of you who are advanced users, I will probably find something that surprises you anyway. So let's start simply. We'll start with video. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, this, the codecs we support, uh, the alpha issues you've probably had when exporting to alpha, and uh, multipass support, which is new to 9.22. So here's a boring list of all the video and image codecs we support. Uh, I don't don't worry about writing all of this down because uh, it all exists online anyway. Uh, there is one thing I'm just going to no quickly note, which is QuickTime. Um, because QuickTime is a 32-bit uh, codec, uh, container, uh, a lot of the codecs that work within it don't actually, uh, uh, won't work in 64-bit. So you need to download uh, QuickTime for Windows to get any QuickTime anyway. But uh, just bear in mind that you're not always going to get support for 32-bit and 64-bit. You can also, uh, and for anything that we don't support, you can now uh, auto transcode to Notch LC, as you may remember from the keynote. So unless your video is already broken or you don't have the video codec for that video, uh, you should be able to get video into Notch now without any issues. But that's importing video. Let's move on to exporting video. Now again, there's way too much in that list to actually <laughs> write down here, but. Um, the, and the only thing I'm really going to mention in this is EXR support. That's new. Uh, and while we don't support uh, multi-pass, multi-layered uh, EXRs, we do support 16-bit and 32-bit exporting, which I'll be touching on a little later. But now we come into the issues, and they're almost always to do with alpha. Now, as this issue comes up a lot in support, I'm going to try and go through this quickly, but let you know what there's basically four reasons you're going to have issues exporting alpha. Number one, you're using the wrong blend modes. The first issue you're likely to have is always uh, that you've not set the right blend mode. So here you can see composite blend mode in the root node. If you set it to one of the blend modes with alpha channel, you'll have a light alpha layer. You can actually check it by clicking preview layer alpha uh, just below that. There you'll see whether your uh, layer actually has an alpha channel. And if it's not, it's probably because you haven't set it to have an alpha channel. Reason number two is the wrong export options. Uh, this is likely because you've just forgotten to select this option in the alpha channel. It's fairly obvious, but it keeps happening all the time. Third reason, wrong codec. These are the video codecs which actually support alpha. And depending on the codec, these are going to be extra ones that you'll have downloaded. Um, I can't list all of the ones in the world. Um, but yeah, most of the time, actually, when we see issues with alpha, it's because you're using the wrong video codec. And your video codec just doesn't support alpha. And those of you, ugh, those of you who can count one of those one more issue, which is straight versus pre-multiplied alpha. So for those of you who don't know, Straight alpha is when your RGB channels and your alpha channels are kept completely separate to your alpha channel. And this is the way you'd kind of expect alpha to work. Uh, but often you can run into uh, problems like uh, incorrect air rough edges, as you might see in the straight version, or incorrect blending. After Effects, for example, expects straight alpha, but most packages can differentiate between the two. Pre-multiplied alpha, on the other hand, uh, the RGB values are multiplied against the alpha channel. This means that whether the alpha channel is used or not, your image will always look the same. And when blending your image, it's more likely to bend smoothly with what's behind it. Uh, Pre-multiplied alpha is the uh, default in Notch, but you can change it in the uh, root node. 
And here's a still from the same rendered effect I showed earlier. Um, and you can really see the difference here. The, on the left with straight, you can see how the hand isn't blending properly with what's behind it, and how there's a much, much brighter line on the left-hand side. And finally, to round out the video section, we've got the final uh, technique, which is multi-pass. While Notch is a fantastic tool for motion graphics, we don't often see it used just for compositing. And we'd like to change that because we think it'd be a really useful tool, especially with multi-pass. So let's look into this. This is a render from C4D using their multi-pass features from R20. It's got a lot of different and standard maps. Uh, but for the most part, these are the tools you would need to try and do something interesting with multi-pass. In fact, the top two, the, left, the indirect lighting and the direct lighting, can just be added together to create the final render, which is what I did here. Um, you do need to correct for gamma, because different things are rendered in different color spaces. Uh, but that's a very basic example, uh, which is uninteresting. So let's do something actually interesting. Let's try and relight that scene using the tools we have in Notch. Now, I'm not going to go through this node by node and property by property, because that would be very boring and tedious, and nobody cares about every, what every attribute is. So let's take general steps for this. First, we're going to use the depth map. This is going to be where we're going to build our effect from. Using this, we can displace a plane in 3D. Now, clearly, there's a really warped curve on that displacement. And that's because uh, in a depth map, it's done in world space, whereas based on the camera, there's going to be large gaps between uh, where it's closer to, the closer to the camera and really small gaps when it's further away. So you get this really annoying warp. But fortunately, we can fix this by changing the angle at which that, um, the angle, changing the um, gradient of that depth map. And the next issue, which you might be able to notice, is that, because I can't quite tell how bright it is on the screen, uh, is that the depth map is now really noisy. And we can fix this by using the normal map. So using the normal map, again, from that multipass uh, image, we can remap the normals of that surface and get smooth lighting rather than the noise we had before. Not change the geometry at all, just changed how the light affects the surface. Now when we add a light, we can see what kind of lighting we're going to get, align the camera to it, and now we've got a pretty good idea of what lighting we're going to apply onto that 3D scene we had before. Again, this is just images displacing a mesh. But we've also seen that the back plane has now been lit, which we don't really want. So using one of the other passes, in this case, the object ID pass, I just threshold it, thresholded it. That's a weird thing to say. Uh, threshold it, I guess, and used it as an alpha, alpha pass to limit the area in which, oh, somebody used the coffee maker. We told people not to use the coffee maker. And now we're angry. Um, yeah, so we can limit the area in which the um, uh, lighting is actually applied. And then we can just add that to the previous scene we had before, and we have our full uh, relit image. And here's the before and after. You can see somebody who has a much better skill in making things look nice could make this look a lot nicer. But the key thing is, this is an extremely useful tool for people who can use this workflow. And here's that node graph again. Apologies for the resolution. I couldn't make it any bigger. Um, and while the scene looks a, com a little complex now, it really is just that scene pass we did before, re-put together and built up again. Uh, so now we've got multi-pass into Notch. What about the opposite, getting multi-pass out of Notch? Well, new to 9.22 is multi-pass exporting. With the new release of NOS, we, Notch, we have access to the G-Buffer as source node, which when combined with the video export node and render queues, will allow you to render multiple buffer passes straight from the notch node graph. So here are the available buffers you can export. Don't worry about copying all these down. Again, everything's going to be available after this talk. Um, and here are, the, are a few of those buffers visualized. Um, on the left, we have the final render. And you can see all the different passes which go together to make that final render on the right. And here's that scene inside of Notch. So how did we get the uh, multi-pass out of it? And it's that group of nodes on the left, these ones. So what we're doing 
is we're taking the gbuffer as source. Each one of the gbuffer sources is set to a different uh, part, uh, to a different pass, and they're all set to have a video export node out of them. And each one of those video export nodes is set to export a file, and then we, and each of those export nodes has been added to the render queue on the left. So when we hit export a video, all of those videos will also be included on that export video, and you'll get about uh, nine or so videos exported. And here we can see all those modified together in Fusion 9. Once again, a better <laughs> designer could make something really interesting in Fusion 9, but I don't know how to use F Fusion 9, so you get this. Mild abomination. And before I move on to the next topic, which is going to be geometry, now I've got another question for you all. How many of you have used Cinema 4D? Quite a lot. That surprises me. OK. How many of you have used Maya? Slightly less. That disappoints me. And how many of you have used 3ds Max or another modeling tool? OK. How many of you have used Lightwave, by the way? That's too many. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK. Now, this, talk, uh, this section of the talk is going to focus on Cinema 4D quite a bit, because we have native support for Cinema 4D. But a lot of what I'm going to say is going to be applicable to more than just Cinema 4D. Click, damn you. Right, so geometry. Important geometry is by far the most common issue we see in support, whether it's textures are flipping or the scale is wrong. So we're just going to move straight into it. These are the formats we support. Fairly standard. Uh, we'll go into Cinema 4D a bit later. But for now, let's look at those issues. Why is it every time we import a mesh, it's fucked? <laughs> the most common issue is, the, <laughs> is a selection of the, the top four. Flip z-axis, flip UVs, materials lo get lost, and uh, massive scene scale. I'll come back to them. Uh, for now, I'm just going to mention the slow import issue. Um, if you're having a mesh import extremely slowly, it's likely because you've left triangula FBX triangulation on or enabled on import. And this is because this uses the FBX's internal triangulation algorithm, uh, algorithm, which can fix broken polys, but it's also really slow, especially with large meshes. Now, I would recommend uh, you use a simpler or better mesh, but if that can't be changed, then disabling this uh, option will load your mesh a lot quicker. Uh, so let's look at a worked example of how to fix these issues. This is importing one of those cubes from earlier. I think this is C4D one. And you can see right out, the, right out the gate, we've got a missing texture. Now, you can just select that texture and replace it with another one. Uh, in this case, I just renamed that texture and forgot about it. Uh, and once you do that, then you'll be able to replace it in Notch. Usually, what I'll do is I'll apply the texture in Notch using our materials view, because it gives you a lot more control as you work through your scene. But uh, immediately after that, we can see that the scene is, uh, the scene is way too big. Now, in cinema, when you, scale, when you export something, a cinema 4D scale, one unit is one centimeter, whereas in Notch, one unit is one meter. So as soon as you import something at one centimeter scale, it gets scaled up to one meter, and everything you own is immediately 100 times bigger. So on import, just scale it down by 100, or just scale it down inside notch by 100. This isn't a unique problem to cinema, but it's most co we see it most commonly in cinema. <laughs> In general, I recommend you do it on import because um, you can get weirdness, like uh, with mocap suits, uh, such as now guys, for example. If you um, scale it down in notch, then it will screw with how their uh, uh, bone hierarchy is applied to a rigged character, for example. So in general, I do it on import. But uh, if it's just a model, it's just like some mermaid on a rock or whatever it is, then don't worry about it. So it's not the impact on performance? No, no effect on performance. Okay. It's not as far as I'm aware. Um, okay, back to it. Uh, with, a cube, with the cube now a reasonable size, you can see the UVs are flipped on the left. So 
because I imported it as a texture means uh, and then applied it notch, I can just flip the just check the flip Y uh, uh, option on the uh, video loader. But otherwise, you'd have to go into material and actually flip the UVs, which can screw you up elsewhere. So I try to avoid that. But once we do that, we can now see the texture. Well, the texture is still flipped in the x-axis, and the back face is now facing forwards. So, and this issue is actually because the z-axis is inverted. And again, now we have to go in and re-import the mesh with FlipZ enabled. And that you do have to go uh, from the uh, re-import form. And with these changes, we can now see our cube is imported properly. If you apply these to the rest of your meshes, it will all be unfucked. The problem is there isn't any standards between 3D tools. So if you need to, this isn't an issue that's uh, you need to not. This will happen in any program. If you're used to interchanging between different 3D programs, you'll be used to this issue. So if you're not used to this issue, you should probably get used to it because it's going to happen throughout your 3D life or until somebody comes up with a standard that everyone adheres to, which is like waiting for God to appear. <laughs> now, just because your mesh is imported fine doesn't mean everything within your mesh is going to import fine. There are certain things which some meshes support and some things, certain things that mesh, certain meshes don't support. Especially when it comes to animation, different formats will support different uh, export types and different animations. So the only thing I'm going to uh, keenly point out right now is that OBJ is, <laughs> you know it's like, yeah. Um, OBJ doesn't support anything. OBJ is just meshes and text and UVs. It's, like, if you're complaining at me because it's not got an animation, it's an OBJ. It doesn't support animation. Please stop the email me. <laughs> uh, and there is actually a second thing I'm going to uh, point out, which is a key issue, a key difference between FBX and Olympic. And that's, and that's skinned versus unskinned or vertex animation. You know, FBX supports skinned animation, whereas FB, uh, Olympic supports vertex animation. But what's the actual difference? So skinned animation is essentially a rigged character. It requires bones to deform the mesh, and you'll be animating those bones. This does mean that controlling the bones means that you control the entire animation over the mesh, which is really useful for an interactive project. And by comparison, a vertex animation mesh, just the positions of each scene are stored for each frame. And what this means, any abstract animation can be stored and played back on a Olympic uh, animation, or a vertex animation. It does mean that it's not very interactive, and even if you deform areas of the mesh, that, those animations are still going to apply, and they're just going to be deformed along with it. And here's an example you can see with the FBX scene, you can see the whole bone hierarchy that's come through, whereas in the uh, Olympic scene, you've just got the mesh, and you've just got the stored animation that comes with it. Now let's look at importing from Cinema 4D. As I mentioned earlier, it supports Cinema 4D scenes but we can't immediately import everything from the Cinema 4D scene. Just because Cinema 4D has its own definitions for certain things, so we need to convert them within Cinema 4D so that Notch can use them. Here's, let's take this example, actually. Here's an example scene. Uh, it's fairly simple, just two lights, a camera, and some display to MoGraph. So let's see, without changing anything, how this imports into Notch. It doesn't. We can see that the lights are coming through, and the camera is important correctly, but the geometry hasn't come through at all. It also helps to note that if a node is grayed out, that means it's just coming through as like a null or position value. So we're not getting any data from it, or any useful data, that means. So, so to import geometry from cinema, we're going to need to convert it from cinema geography, geometry, like MoGraph or 3D primitives, to edit editable meshes, which Notch can understand. In Cinema, you can do this by selecting your geometry and pressing the C key. But with MoGraph, you're going to select all the cylinder objects and need to convert them as well. In my scene, I combined them all together into one object. And while this isn't absolutely necessary, it will improve performance a lot. If you have multiple objects with all, uh, all with different meshes, it's, uh, it can be a real tax on the GPU, or DRAM, I can't remember exactly. 
Um, so it's usually best to um, import all your meshes is one single mesh. In this case, that's what I did. And here we can see that it imports perfectly fine into Notch without any buggery. Now let's look into the final section of geometry, which is exporting geometry. This is something we get asked a little bit about, so, and it's, well, this is something we get asked quite a lot about, really. And it's a fairly simple process, which isn't very well known. So I'm going to go through it here and now, and hopefully you can tell others for me. So let's say we have this animated notch mesh, or we'll have to pretend it's animated, because Google Slides doesn't like video at the moment. Exporting the mesh is very similar to exporting the videos through our multi-pass. All we need to do is add the geometry export node. Here we can see the setup. It's just connecting the mesh for export. Uh, connecting the mesh we want to export to the geometry source input of the geometry export node, and then connecting the geometry export node itself into the root. We'll know that it's hashed out, which means it's not going to do anything. So by selecting the ellipses in the geometry exports uh, properties, we can select the... Um, yeah, uh, we can get the choice between animated Olympic files and OBJ sequence. It's your choice, whichever you want to use. I'll tend to go with an Olympic sequence, uh, with an Olympic uh, animated file, because it's nicer to deal with one file than 500 OBJs. <coughs> so once you selected your settings, uh, you just hit uh, OK. The node is now active and ready to uh, be exported. And when we export a video, uh, we'll get the geometry out. And here's what it looks like in C4D. Okay. Now, as we've seen, as I've said, with all these files, these will be able to download in an after, after NotchCon. So don't worry about uh, chasing me up that afterwards. And now, before we go into the final section, uh, which is particles, uh, I do want to mention one other thing, or reiterate another thing, which is substance materials. In case you haven't heard about it already, we have now got native support for substance materials. Uh, you can import a substance SBAR material straight into Notch. So all the control and power you can get from the substance can now be implemented straight into Notch. Uh, I'm not going to go into this into further detail with this now. Uh, I simply have too much to talk about already. But Will Smith is in the room. Oh, he ran away. He came in earlier. Um, there he is. <laughs> Uh, he's going to be talking about it uh, tomorrow at 10 a.m. So if you're not hungover, do go and say hi. Or at least wait for him to finish before you sit down. Otherwise, last section, particles. Now, I've only got two main sections here because people don't usually use this. Uh, so let's go straight into them. Why would we import and export particles? Notch has already got a really incredible and fast particle system, so why would we even want to import an export particle system anyway? Well, first of all, it's good for determinism. By using a pre-cached or imported animation, we can, uh, we can predictably animate against that particle system. So if we're making a specific effect for a specific video and we want the particles to react just that way that it worked one time, if we animate that, if we export that animation, and we'll get a predictable particle system that can run every single time. Unfortunately, this makes it bad for interactivity, because as soon as you start moving around those particles, they'll still want to car carry on their current path. So while it might work for some very minorly animations, uh, I'm sure that makes sense, uh, pre-cached animations, it's not very good if you have a, any um, large animation movement, animated particle sequences. And the last reason you'd want to import particles is to import particles from another tool, or ex export particles from another tool. So let's move into that. All the formats that you can import into Notch. Currently, we support RealFlow, Notch caches, and Olympic particles. <clears throat> and we're basically just importing a particle animation. There's no, going to be no, particle da no color data, no velocity data, it's just the part of, uh, the animated position. But this may change in the future. For now, I just want to look, take a closer look at importing particles from RealFlow. 
So here's a very basic particle animation from your flow. It's actually one of those samples because I have no idea how to use your flow. Um, normal particle systems in real flow can export to the bin format. I did find one that did. And uh, I've set it to export in both bin and a limit. Now, bin sequences can be imported but just by selecting the first frame. However, Olympic sequences need to be stitched together into one Olympic file. Thankfully, in real flow, there is a built-in option to stitch together Olympic files in the tools menu set. Just select the Olympic sequence, choose the, uh, all the files, and then hit stitch, and they'll come out as one animated Olympic file. Now, when importing to notch, it's fairly obvious for real flow. You'll select it from the particles drop-down menu, but for Olympic, you'll need to import it under the geometry tab. Not to recognize the particles on import and make it available, uh, but uh, it's under the geometry tab because geometry is generally used for geometry. Limbic is generally used for geometry formats. From here, what you need to do is make a simple particle scene, select the, cache, the cached uh, particle sequence, and add it to a, uh, or import it to a particle cache emitter. Your particles will appear in notch. Perfectly fine. I've added some attribute shading because it makes it look nicer. However, it looks blown out on the screen, which is disappointing. Now, it's important to note a couple of things with this workflow. Firstly, one particle cache emitter node can be used in a particle system. Only one particle cache emitter node can be used in a particle system at a time. The particle cache emitter will take over all, life, all particle emission and life controls within a particle system. So if you want to have multiple cache emitter, particle cache emitters, you'll need to have multiple separate particle systems. Secondly, the particle roots and non-particles will still control the number of particles that can be used at any time. So if you notice that some of your particles begin to disappear towards the end of your particle animation, it's probably because you need to uh, raise the particle count by a lot especially with real flow. And here's that particle system again, now being meshed in notch with the uh, procedural systems. <coughs> now for the final section I have for you today, which I'm sure you've been waiting for, exporting particles. So for exporting particles, we, we support a little more than we do importing with the extra, the extra additions being lightweight particles and blender caches. So let's work, you know, let's move straight into a worked example. So here's a notch particle system. I assure you it looks lovely in motion, but again, I'm not dealing with Google, uh, Google size videos right now. Uh, I, if I was to export this, how would I uh, get it into Houdini? In notch, exporting particles is a little different to the other two. Rather than rendering them via a node, and export by video dialog, all you need to do is right-click the particle root node, go to the particle root options, and select how you want to export your particle cache. As an aside, if you think all this exporting stuff is a bit odd and convoluted, that's because it is. Um, we don't like it, <laughs> so we're going to change it in the future, but for now it is what it is, I'm afraid. Anyway, here's that particle system then meshed in Houdini. Um, I had Ted Palace. Is Ted Palace here? No. No? Okay. Uh, well, this guy, Ted Palace, he helped me do this. So if you have any idea, if you want to know how to do this, you'll have to ask Ted. But using, being able to export particles and import them into your DNA would be really powerful for the future. And one more thing before I go into the Q&A, uh, I'll just give you a sneak peek at what's coming next. Open VDB support. For those of you who don't know what OpenVDB support is, OpenVDB is, it will basically allow you to export field systems and procedural volumes into and out of Notch. So you can take a procedural mesh from Houdini and use it to generate particles in Notch, or you can take a, a, a procedural volume or field from uh, Maya and then bring that into Notch, or export from Notch into Maya. And as it happens, our implementation of uh, procedurals and fields is fairly in line with the OpenVDB standard already. So support for this product, while not planned for 922, is definitely in the near future for us. And with that, I'm done. Q and A. So what have I missed? Go on. Yes. Uh, is there 
learning way uh, to import um, camera modifiers. I'm doing 3D mapping projects, and it will be very important to import, to be able to import the, the camera offset um, or, or image plane shifting for um, 3D as max is called camera correction modifiers, um, which makes this parallel uh, point uh, perspective correction. Okay. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, it'll depend on the system you're using. It's when you have a building and you yeah. have a camera uh, which is lower, and yeah. then you look and you have a lead just trapezoid. Right. Oh, you want to just walk it back, right? Yeah. Uh, and in that case, we'd probably recommend you just use one of the post effects nodes. Because in post effects, you can, you, there's a four point walk, for example, you can just drag that back out again, for example. Um, in terms of that kind of mapping, we'd probably recommend you start looking into um, UVs and how you remap it using the UV mapping tools. Uh, go ahead. Are there any limitations on this export geometry? Export geometry, no. Not as far as I'm aware, or not as far as I've found, at least. Um, so, okay. Uh, the, 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 what you need to do there is uh, combine all your geometry uh, into one mesh. Export geometry basically you will only export one mesh. So you need to combine everything into a, a one mesh using the combined geometry node. <clears throat> Just down a bottle of water and I'm trying to breathe. Um, so, uh, yeah, you need to combine it into one mesh. And then when you hit export, it'll work. But you need to, uh, you'd hook everything into the combined geometry node. And then uh, from there, you then use the combined geometry node as the export uh, source. And then you'll export. Uh, another thing on that note. Uh, export ge exported geometry doesn't support um, uh, color data or UVs at the moment because uh, the, uh, that's just not in the pipeline yet. Although we have looked into uh, color data and that might be other thing. Plus, None of you put your hands up. They've got outside. They're about to move. Yeah, yeah they, they are. So, uh, can we get a round of applause for Ryan? Um, and uh, I don't know. To Ryan. Up at the lawn, they will start in about ten no. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so please feel free to uh, go and enjoy the food um, and drink. The food will be starting at seven o'clock. And in the meantime, we can just watch Ryan eat his cake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I disappoint you all now by telling you it's not my birthday. They just like to get me drunk and call me my mother. <laughs> <laughs> However, I will eat this.